Hey there chemists, uh, in this lesson we're going to look at some properties of metals and try to use what we've been talking about in terms of their electronic arrangement to explain those properties. Uh, so if you take a look at your notes, <laughs> super short answers to the aim. Why do metals shine and why do metals conduct? So metals we can often think of as being shiny, they are lustrous. Uh, often they have smooth surfaces and those reflect rays of light all in the same direction. That's what makes something shiny if you have reflection off of a surface where they're all in the same direction. Things that are very rough on the surface will, will still reflect, uh, but if the reflections are all in very different directions, then you get uh, not a very shiny, lustrous surface. Uh, Nonmetals can be smoothed out to a shiny surface. It's just easier to do it with metals. Uh, more so, metals conduct because of their electronic arrangement. Their electrons are capable of moving. And here I have a picture that illustrates what the electronic arrangement of a metal is in very simple terms. You probably learned this in a previous chemistry course. Uh, there is a C, what we often call a C, of delocalized, meaning not localized, uh, mobile valence electrons. And there they are, scattered throughout this array of positively charged nuclei. So it's sort of like all of these nuclei of whatever metallic element we're talking about are simultaneously sharing these very mobile electrons. It's sort of uh, a very large scale version of what we use resonance uh, for to explain molecules that share electrons across many atoms. But here we're talking about continuum of atoms on a very large scale. And uh, the rest of this is sort of cations. These, these nuclei are just cations in an ordered array. And that's the short answer to just why metals conduct. Uh, but not all metals have the same type of conduction, so let's go a, a step farther and look at the various degrees of conduction that we can get and what really makes something a conductor versus an insulator versus in between, a semiconductor. And for that, we need to look at what's called band theory, uh, which is an extension of the molecular orbital theory that we looked at in the previous lesson. So I'm just gonna read this passage. It says, in a solid, we have n valence electrons because of, sorry, n valence electron orbitals, atomic orbitals, all of the same energy and they can combine to make metallic bonds and there are n possible energy levels that will result. It's very similar to how we had atomic orbitals combining to make a number of molecular orbitals, but here we're talking about metallic bonding in this array of cations surrounded by mobile electrons, but you will still have half of them lower in energy, what look like bonding, and half of them will be higher, what look like anti-bonding, and um, these create a band of energy gaps. I'll show you what I mean, and then it'll make more sense, I think, when we talk about conduction. So let's say we plot uh, along the x-axis the number of atomic orbitals, number of atomic orbitals, for just some metal M. Let's say it's a pure metal, pure element, and we're gonna plot that on the y-axis vertically, the energy. And let's consider how many atomic orbitals we have based on just how many atoms we have. So if there's just one atom, you have one atomic orbital at some energy level. Let's go to the right incrementally. Then we have two. Uh, you would get two molecular orbitals. Two atoms in, two energy atomic orbitals in, two molecular orbitals out, same thing. We keep going, three would give us three, four would give us four, this is getting a little redundant, I hope you can tell, five would give us five, and I'm gonna stop there and say, well, let's go all the way to N, some N number of atomic orbitals, that would give me N uh, molecular orbitals, and it would start to look like this continuum of molecular orbitals until we eventually get what people call a, a band. This is a band of orbitals. 
Uh, that represents the energies that are higher and the energies that are lower, uh, which is what we see in metals. Just like what we saw for molecular orbitals, we see a similar thing for the atomic orbitals of metal atoms coming together to share all these electrons. The upper part is called the conduction band. And the lower part is called the valence band. But the most important part is actually that space in between. This is called the band gap. And in order to get conduction, we need to be able to promote an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. It needs to be able to cross that band gap. And sometimes just visible light is enough energy to do that. It depends on what the element is. And enough of this has been studied that we can actually talk about that band gap in terms of an energy value. We usually use what's called an electron volt. So I'm gonna give you some numbers just for comparison here. Carbon's band gap, that's what this E sub G is. This is the band gap energy. Carbon's band gap energy is 5.4 electron volts, that's lowercase e, capital V. Uh, an electron volt is exactly what it sounds like. It's the potential of an electron. So think about past physics classes, or maybe earlier in this chem class. Uh, an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That's the fundamental unit of charge for uh, an electron. And then if you simply multiply that by a volt, which is a joule per coulomb, you actually get that numerical value, but in joules. So really the best thing to write here is that 1 EV is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. That's just to give you a appreciation for what it is, and we'll use that conversion. Anyway, back to this table, just to give you a sense. Carbons is 5.4. Silicons is much smaller. It's only 1.10 electron volts. Germanium's is 0.72. Tin's even smaller. And lead's is about zero. And that's really the point. As you go from a higher band gap energy to a lower band gap energy, you go from something that's essentially an insulator to something that's a conductor. So it depends on what the element is small band gap or zero band gap, uh, electrons can promote very easily and you get conduction. You get mobility in the conduction band. Let's close out here with just one quantitative thing. Most of this is qualitative, but I'll just show you how we can quantify this uh, and relate it back to energy of light. You shine light on metals. How do we know if it conducts or not? Well, it's all about if that light has enough energy to promote an electron across the band gap. So let's take a look. Let's say we have green light of roughly 500 nanometers, and I wanna know, is this enough to excite electrons across the band gap of silicon, typically thought of as a semiconductor? So let's use our equation that's true for the energy related to wavelength, that's E equals HC over lambda, Planck's constant speed of light and wavelength of light. So Planck's constant is 6.626, times 10 to the negative 34 joules seconds. Speed of light, I'm just gonna use three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And then let's divide by the wavelength. Remember 500 nanometers, that's 500 times 10 to the negative nine meters. I'm just gonna write it like that so I get the metric conversion right in there. I don't have to worry about my units. Although I do have to worry about my units because if I'm comparing a band gap energy, I would love electron volts instead of joules. So let's use that conversion from joules into electron volts. There is one electron volt per 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. It's just the fundamental unit of charge and energy. That's how many joules there are in an EV. Uh, you might have a Planck's constant that's already in EVs. That certainly makes this easier if that's the case. Uh, look at your units, do some dimensional analysis. Meters cancel with meters, seconds cancel with per seconds, even joules cancel with per joules, you are in EVs. When you plug in all this math, you get 2.48 electron volts, and that is larger than the band gap energy for silicon. 
So we could say more than enough energy, more than enough energy to conduct. And I'll just say more than enough energy, too crowded. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to the electronic arrangement found in metals. Uh, we look at their electrons as a sea of mobile valence delocalized electrons. That's why they conduct, why they have the ability. We can get more detailed and look at the band gap energy, which is unique for each element. I'm not going to go into how we get those numbers for each element. We'll just know that they exist. That's for beyond the scope. Or we could talk about indirectly how we get it from known uh, wavelengths of light and whether or not we see conduction. Uh, our next and last lesson on solids will be to how we tweak that conduction uh, particularly with semiconductors by making mixtures, things like alloys.